In this episode of Life on Jupiter, we'll describe the components to enjoyable and successful cruising, including things to look for when buying a cruising boat and ways to prepare the boat you have to optimize your cruising success. There's nothing more to say. <laughs> G'day. We've done a few miles on Jupiter 2 and although I've been sailing most of my life, in the last two and a half years full-time cruising on Jupiter, I think we've learned a thing or two. I think I could sum up in four areas or four aspects which really make enjoyable cruising. Weather, obviously. You want the correct weather to go to where you want to go and do the things you want to do. Crew, who's joining you on board? Do you have strangers, which maybe that's what you're after? Or do you have your loved ones, which is great. We're not gonna talk about those two things today. What we're gonna talk about is what makes a seaworthy and safe vessel for cruising and how to equip that vessel for cruising. So let's get into it. I approach long distance and remote area cruising the same way I did my previous job as an airline pilot. It's very similar. You're driving a complex machine carrying precious cargo from A, a long distance, to B. And you want to do it safely and comfortably. The machines are similar. They are designed to protect you against adverse elements and get you from A to B and that could be a long time. It could be a 15 hour flight or it could be a 15 day passage. So the way you approach it should be similar. The design of a passenger jet is such that it can tolerate failures. Unlike Apollo 13, failure is an option. That's awesome. <laughs> Unlike Apollo 13, failure is an option and it should be tolerated because it happens. You, it's unavoidable, things break. It's an extreme environment, things break. The most obvious thing on an airliner is the engines. You may have noticed that most airliners have at least two engines. And in fact, reliability is so good these days that you normally only have two engines. There's a lot going on behind the scenes though. There's hydraulics, pneumatics, pressurization, electrical generation. You gotta have that coffee hot, don't you? So a sailing boat or a cruising vessel is the same. Airliners have many layers of redundancy so that you can continue your journey to your destination. There's only a handful of things which could go wrong where you may have to divert to the nearest airport or on a sailing boat, the nearest port. Other failures are tolerated or have a level of redundancy to be able to continue to get to your destination. So today we're gonna to talk about quite a number of different things that you need to do or have or prepare for to make enjoyable and successful cruising. Now you guys already know that Jupiter is a multi-hull catamaran and I've chosen this particular design catamaran as my long distance or remote area cruising vessel. And I did this for good reason. Multi-hulls inherently have levels of redundancy that monohulls don't have. Now I'm not saying that a multi-hull is a better cruising vessel. I'm just saying it has some inherent redundancies or backup features that monos don't have. And that obvious one, what does multi-hulls have which monohulls don't? An extra hull. Now don't turn it off just yet. <laughs> I'm not gonna play on this for too long. But if you were to hole your hull out at sea, you've hit a container in the water or a, or a log and you've broken open the bow, you've still got plenty of flotation. Obviously the other hull, 
And if a well-designed multi-hull will have flotation compartments and you're going to remain upright, maybe leaning to one side a little bit, but you're certainly going to be able to start an engine and motor your way to where the nearest port. You obviously don't want to put a sail up if you're leaning already. So multi-hulls have redundancy with hulls. Duh. A critical component for a sailing boat is the rig. Now I know it's not practical to carry a spare rig. The only thing that's holding this guy up are these little wires here. There's a lot of cruising catamarans out there that were designed for the charter market with only three stays. You lose one. Ideally, a cruising rig will have multiple stays. Two shrouds each side, two forestays, two backstays if you have backstays. Catamarans don't have backstays, but I have six stays holding this rig up. If one was to break, there's a good chance the rig will stay up, depending on what sails you're running at the time and the conditions. But make sure you've got redundancy for your rig. Now obviously another inherently redundant feature that catamarans have is two engines. There's nothing more to say. <laughs> Why do you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> you want to absolutely critical is make sure you have at least two fuel tanks. Now I don't mean for quantity, same as with the water. I mean in case you lose one. And that could be either a leak or could get contaminated for example, this tank here, uh, about four years ago, I got a bad case of diesel bug, which is a bacteria or a fungus that just builds up on the walls of your tank and the floor of your tank. And um, it's like a slime and it'll just break off, float into your fuel line and block it. Uh, I was helping deliver a, a friend of mine's boat from Phuket to Brunei. It was about a 12, 1500 mile trip. He was mostly motoring because there was no wind, it was the wrong season. Once we got into the South China Sea where there was a bit of a wave, a bit of a swell, the sloshing of the fuel dislodged all the fuel bug that was growing up the, the walls of the tank and the fuel turned into soup. So what we ended up doing was uh, getting jerry cans. We, we would get the fuel out of the tank, filter it into a jerry can, and then we just put the inlet hose straight into the jerry can, and we went like that for the next week. So if you have two tanks, there's a really good chance that one of them will be okay. Not only two tanks, but make sure the plumbing is separated too, because if you had these two tanks joining at a T-piece just here and then single line to the engine, you could have a blockage all the way into that plumbing, all through that plumbing, could be blocked. So have two hoses running to the engine and the T-piece right at the engine and the valves there where you can change tanks. Most important to have redundancy for your fuel. Another inherent redundancy with catamarans and don't worry, multi-hull guys, I'm going to get on to other equipment soon, so just bear with us on this. The catamarans have two rudders, and that's just spectacular <laughs> redundancy for breaking off a rudder. You've got another one just sitting there. And I know of a multi-hull guy that's cruised around for a long time with just one rudder. So he didn't have redundancy anymore. But not only do you need redundancy for your rudders, you need redundancy for your steering system complete. If you break a cable or a hydraulic line, how do you steer the boat? Make sure you have some system set up for that. 
some multi hulls have multiple steering stations for example like uh, they have one on the starboard quarter and one on the port quarter some have inside helms and outside helms but they're not necessarily separate steering systems they may be all one system you need to make sure you've got a separate way of steering the boat in case you break a cable or a hydraulic line. In Jupiter's case, I've got an external tiller bar. And now I can just go down and grab that with my hand and steer it like a dinghy. It's a bit of force required. Or I can tie ropes onto the eyelets that are already there and then I can just pull and pull ropes to uh, steer the boat as a, as a backup steering. So please make sure you've got a backup steering system and you know how to use it. Make sure you got redundancy for your steering. Hey crew, sorry for the rude interruption. Just wanted to let you in on a little secret. We're about seven months behind in our weekly videos. But we've got so many great adventures and tips, we just have to keep making them. But in actual real time, we're here in New York on the Hudson and we're heading to the Great Lakes and then down the Illinois, the Mississippi, the Tennessee rivers into the Gulf of Mexico. So if you want to keep up to date with what Jupiter's really doing, we'd love to have you over there on Patreon where we put out a weekly current update. Hope to see you there. Cheers. What's one thing that's even more important than fuel? Water. You will die without it after a few days. Very important, critical to carry at least two tanks of water. And I'm talking about quantity, I'm talking about the chance of it getting spoiled or leaking out. You've doubled your chances of success if you carry two tanks. Check out our video series on the complete ocean crossing checklist to see how we manage water on passage. We'll put a link in the description below. Critically important. Nice and clean. Did I mention inspection ports are a really good idea? Otherwise, what are you drinking? <laughs> On a modern cruising boat, if you're anything like us, you've got a heap of electronics. You're going to have to consider an alternate source of electrical power. Make sure you have a backup redundancy for your electrical power. Make sure you have redundancy for your solar panels, solar panel regulator. We have two on Jupiter for running two banks of solar panels, wind turbines, even standalone generators. And of course, for the catamaran, two engines, you got two alternators. But also, make sure you have two battery banks. Now that's fairly common anyway for boats that have the old classical system of house bank and start bank. So you're pretty well covered there. If you can start your engine some way, you can get power into something, assuming your alternator is working. We don't have that on Jupiter. I have uh, two banks of lithium uh, of equal size and they're in parallel. So if one of these cells was to break down for some reason, we just use the other bank. Also for AC power, most of our toys run on AC. We've got the TV, we've got the computers, even phones need to be charged via AC adapters. We've got a backup inverter also, and they're pretty cheap if you buy a Chinese one, you know, of reasonable quality, and that would be fine as a backup inverter. But whatever you do, make sure you got backup electricity. For long distance or remote area cruising, navigation and communications are important. In our video series, The Complete Ocean Crossing Checklist, I go into more depth 
on what we carry here on Jupiter to go vast distances. But in a nutshell, you want backup. Now a lot of people may have a chart plotter and the iPad and charts on both of those. And I would tend to agree that that's probably okay. In addition to that, I've got an old chart plotter which sort of still works. And I carry some paper charts, definitely not all of them, because they're so expensive. It would inhibit us from cruising. Make sure you've got additional GPS transmitters. Don't rely on that uh, iPad to pick up GPS satellites just by itself. Communications, well, some people claim that that's the reason they've gone cruising, to get away from everybody. And they don't want to be in touch with people. But most of us have family and loved ones which are concerned for us and we need to stay in touch. We've got an Iridium Go sat phone. We've found that to be not cheap, but effective way. Plus it also provides us updated weather. VHF as a bare minimum, so you can contact a passing ship. HF is still usable and we've used it at sea on occasion as well. Make sure you got backups for navigation and communication. One of the most basic backups that you need for long distance cruising, spare parts. Now, you know, you immediately think of engine spares, for example, but remember, you're a sailboat in this instance. You need spares for, you know, I've got just hardware, cleats, what do you call them? Carabiners, shackles, got electrical spares, got plumbing spares, after you build a water maker you accumulate a lot of spares and of course you need the tools and the know-how. So start learning, YouTube is fantastic for that, while you've got internet and start accumulating the tools that you may need and the spare parts. I'm probably verging on being a hoarder, <laughs> so Jupiter's pretty heavy with all my spares. So another consideration that you want to have redundancy for is your sustenance. Food. So on Jupiter we've had two fridges all this time and fairly recently we made one into a freezer so that's even better. But yeah you don't want to lose all your cold goods if suddenly your freezer dies on passage. Uh, it's fine to be eating canned food, you know, for a passage, but we really prefer to have fresh fruit and veggies and cold drinks, because most of our cruising is in the tropics here. What's going in the soup? I'm going to put lettuce, and we still have sweet potato. Mm -hmm. What else? Garlic? Okay. Yeah, if you want. Not only is refrigeration important, but it's a luxury to be able to cook your food, is it not? So, prepare for a backup source of cooking. So our main cooktop is the induction cooker here. Uh, as a backup to that, or if we need more than one burner, of course, we've got the, the gas stove. But our gas bottles are lasting, like one bottle will last a year because we hardly ever use this. But it's a great backup. And if they all fail, the gas bottle leaks out, our batteries are flat, and we are in a post-apocalyptic world. Always got my trusty camp stove with the gas can. Ugh, yeah, no way. Okay, so we've got two forms of cooking. And we're good with that. So this next point that I'm going to talk about applies to all cruising vessels. Doesn't matter what's hot, except solo sailors, I guess. 
what could that be? Crew. Exactly. You need redundancy for the captain. What happens when he's gone for a swim? What happens when he's sick, incapacitated, unconscious, in huge pain, terrible... Oh, jeez, I'm feeling bad now. <laughs> Train the crew in the most critical parts of maneuvering the boat. You need man overboard recovery training. Uh, train them, uh, first aid would be nice, <laughs> but yeah. you know, how to uh, start the uh, engines, how to pull down the sails, how to navigate to the nearest port. They need to know where they are physically on the map at all times. Hey, I mean, you need redundancy for the captain. Princess, what's the man overboard procedure? I don't know. Train your crew. Train them. So I think that wraps up what I wanted to say about uh, the importance of backup equipment and redundancy and how important it is for a cruising boat long distances. And Are you done yet? No. Use the other one. Can you hurry up? Use the other one. Sorry, guys. Um, so, now I know most of us are on quite a strict budget when we go cruising and doubling up on some of this gear is expensive, but seek out this equipment now and maybe buy secondhand gear as a backup. But uh, it is critically important to have these things because if you get it now when it's easy to get it, it's much better than sending away for it, uh, having it shipped or flown in to St. Helena in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean, for example. Um, much cheaper to get this equipment now. So yeah, I think I've wrapped this up, uh, but it really is really important to think about these things before you head off. And it just makes for such a much more pleasant and smooth experience when something breaks You're ready to go, ready to fix it. Keep going to your destination. Are you done? No, it went away. Okay, oh, I'm done. So cut. You stopped it, yeah? <laughs>